Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Mindful Constitution podcast. I'm so excited to talk to a friend, Carly Soar, today. Soar is how you say your last name. Soar. Soar. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Soar. And we're here talking about parenting with intention, which is a masterclass she does through her uh, business learning with intention, which is in- essentially parent coaching, which is so cool. And you have a background in executive functioning and speech pathology. Yeah. So now that I just stumbled through like what exactly you do, can you tell us a little more yeah. detail about what exactly you do? Of course. <laughs> sure, Katie. So yeah. So my business name is learning with intention and you know, as a parent coach with a background in speech language pathology and executive functions, um, really what I'm offering is parent coaching for parents who want to get intentional about how they're showing up for themselves, for their children. Um, you know, it can be really challenging, particularly with kids who have, you know, different learning profiles or sensory processing difficulties, um, And, you know, just helping parents navigate all of that and, you know, show up as their best selves, keeping in Mm -hmm. mind that all of us, our best selves include messy moments, challenging moments, wild emotions all over the place. Um, So, yeah, that's kind of what I'm doing these days. Yeah, I know. I love your Instagram is very um, down to earth, which (laughs) I'm always a big fan of the like realistic shit, you know, especially, I mean, as a new mom for the first time, I feel like it's amazing, but there's obviously like those hard moments too. And it's just nice to see when people address those. Yeah. So I know for me, I'm always curious what, and I, people always ask me to, as a fellow coach, you know, like what led you to this area of coaching and how you Mm -hmm. got there. And so I would love to hear more about what that path looked like for you and how you kind of landed where you are with parent coaching. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, as a speech language pathologist, I've been helping families navigate challenging moments for many, many years now. Um, Mm -hmm. But it really wasn't until I became a parent myself that I realized like just how difficult it can be. You know, I like laugh at myself as like a, an SLP in my twenties, like giving parents these little strategies. And it's like, just totally not having any concept of like the parent's nervous system plays such a factor in whether or not they can utilize strategies, whether or not, you know, they have access to their thinking brain in any given moment. And so really, you know, when I became a parent, I was just like in the shit of it with my own kids in the middle of the pandemic and homeschooling and doing all of the things and trying to, you know, address my own emotional regulation and doing my own inner work. Um, really, it just came down to kind of combining all of my professional background and expertise and everything I know about executive functions and emotional regulation, and then combining it with like, what does it actually look like in real life? And what is actually accessible to parents in the day to day? So Mm -hmm. yeah, that's where parenting with intention kind of came from. It blossomed during the pandemic, like so many So many things did for a lot of people, I feel like actually out of a really hard time, it was an opportunity for so many people to um, reevaluate what they want to be doing, especially, and I know we'll dive into this later, but I see it a lot too with people with alcohol and then redefining their relationship there. It's just like super reflective time. Yeah. Absolutely. Sort of like going in, we were all basically forced to go inward more than we're used to. Right. And so, yeah. You find out some things when you go in, right? <laughs> yeah, like that you want to and don't want to. Mm-hmm. Like, oh crap, yeah. this is really hard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So you said first of all, um, you said about how much a parent's nervous system and our 
Mm -hmm. own, you know, plays in our role as a parent and our relationship Mm -hmm. with our children. And can you dive in a little bit more to that? Because I know this is something that I always emphasize so much too, is until you address your own nervous system, I mean, your relationships, your own healing, it's really hard for anything else to unfold the way that you want it to really. So yeah, I would love to hear a little more about that within the relationship with our kids. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, you know, I developed this course called Authentic Emotional Regulation. And the reason why I took a deep dive into authentically regulating emotions is because there's so much messaging out there that I call, I refer to as like the myth of calm, right? So it's like all of this like inundated messaging around like how to show up as like the calm, gentle parent and how important it is, you know, to be able to be calm with your child. And, you know, I think that there are a lot of well-intentioned coaches and therapists and experts out there. Like the the intention I think is, you know, well-meaning. But what I think it lacks is a realistic understanding of the fact that we as parents, as mothers, we have a nervous system and our nervous system is designed to dysregulate when we feel overwhelmed or unsafe, right? So to think that we could possibly show up as calm and serene and gentle all the time, or like that that's the thing that we should be striving for, just quite frankly, is not even like neurobiologically possible. So it's just yet another unattainable thing that women are now striving for. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think like being able to learn how to realistically address your own nervous system dysregulation, anticipating that that's going to happen, knowing that it's going to happen and not feeling any unnecessary shame or guilt around that, right? Mm -hmm. Just like, we all have an amygdala in our brains. It's going to fire when we get overwhelmed, right? So like if we can just plan on that and learn ways to tend to our own bodily reaction, then that's how we can show up with Mm -hmm. intention and with connection, right? It's not about showing up as calm. It's about remaining connected first to ourselves and then to our child. That's the best we can do. Right. Yeah. Yes. Realistic. Like you're going to lose your shit sometimes. And it was so funny. I had uh, another um, coach on here who does mindfulness based stress reduction and parenting. And she was saying the same thing. She's like, I mean, I do mindfulness based stress reduction, but I'm a parent. I lose my shit. Like everyone loses their shit. And I think just embracing it and surrendering to the fact that like that's going to happen at times actually allows us to handle it better than trying to fight it. And you see gentle parenting a lot, and I appreciate the sentiment of it, but it is like, there seems like there's no room for losing your shit. Yeah. Yeah. And it kind of gives me creepy vibes, like straight up, like striving for only gentle parenting where people are always talking to their kids in that calm, monotone voice. I'm like, this just doesn't feel... Right. For some reason. I mean, it's basically just like repackaged patriarchal bullshit, right? That's like, we should be able to be serene and, you know, it's just not realistic. It's not biologically realistic. And, you know, I, I feel like I'm more in line with like, we're human beings and we're here to Mm -hmm. have like the wide range of our human emotional experience. And really, if we do actually want to teach our kids about emotional regulation, showing up as calm all the time isn't going to teach them shit. We need to show up with our full broad spectrum of emotion and show them how to navigate that. Yeah. Show them what it looks like to be, you know, boiling hot rage. And can we do that? Can we show up in our anger, in our frustration while remaining in our integrity? And honestly, mm-hmm. some of us don't have any model for that, right? So we mm-hmm. do have to like learn that from scratch. Um, And so parenting with intention is like getting intentional about, you know, addressing some of your generational trauma, addressing some of the conditioning that you have around 
emotions and you know whether you grew up in a family that like shoved emotions and tried to sweep them under the rug or you grew up in an explosive anger family you know basically none of us are coming from like a perfect model it just wasn't accessible in the generation generations prior to us yeah and and too like you said is just remaining calm all the time How, what is that setting your kids up for because we are meant to have the full spectrum of emotions and understanding. I always think of emotions as directionals and they're there to tell us something as long as we try not to avoid them, which we so often do with like distractions or suppression. Alcohol is a great one, but there's Mm -hmm. like plenty of distractions to choose from and also just avoidance and Um, pushing them down, which we could talk about how that leads to its own set of problems with health and all of that stuff. And so uh, modeling for your kids, like, yeah, shitty emotions happen. It's kind of part of life. And then like, this is why it happened for me today. And this Mm -hmm. is what I'm going to do about it. And kind of showing them uh, how to ride the waves of emotions as opposed to just not experience them at all. Totally. And, you know, like with a, with a compassionate lens on it, like if you really don't know how to do that, if you've never had the experience of like safely riding out an intense emotional wave, then of course you're going to distract from it because you don't know how to do it. You don't, you know, Mm -hmm. like it makes sense that you would want to run away from that feeling. Right. And that's your brain literally downshifting into, you know, fight, flight, or freeze. Like you're freezing up or you're running away, you're fleeing. Right. And, and that all makes sense that it, it makes sense that that's what blanketly we're doing as a society, because many of us haven't learned how to safely ride a true gnarly emotional wave from beginning, middle to end. Yeah. I think it's twofold too, you know, like we have, a lot of us have, or threefold, I guess you could say, like a lack (laughs) of tools. (laughs) I'm like tenfold, I'll I'll be here all day. Um, One is sometimes just like a lack of awareness that we don't even know. So we're not even at the point where we're like aware that we don't, are distracting ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then the second is that, um, that we like live in a like society that makes it really easy for us to just constantly distract ourselves. And I think that it's kind of almost pushed, like it's hard to have lives that aren't constantly triggering and Mm -hmm. aren't constantly activating us just because of the way the world is structured. So Mm -hmm. I don't know. I feel like there's so many things that can make it really hard to kind of sit with your emotions and ride them out and see what they're trying to tell you when most people have really hectic, chaotic, stressful lives. We're either not aware of how to ride emotions or not aware that we're not doing it or don't have the tools to do so. So it's just so many things contributing to. Yeah. Yeah. And I saw uh, Instagram that you posted recently. I think I saw it today. So well-timed, but (laughs) Um, it said the three things we should be talking to our kids about, and it said dopamine, nervous system regulation, and one other thing. And I thought blood that sugar. was yeah. blood sugar balance, mm-hmm. eating for blood mm-hmm. sugar. Yeah. Um, and the effect that can have on our mood. And so, yeah, elaborate on that. Cause I really love that post. Yeah, totally. You know, you and a lot of people responded to that post, um, which kind of put me into gear to create a little something. So I did, I created a guide and I'll I'll post that for, for people to take a little bit of a deeper dive into, Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of broken down by age group, like the two to four year range, the five to seven and eight to 12. Um, and so really what I was talking about there is that when we start talking to our kids early on about their biology, about the Mm -hmm. fact that they have a nervous system, about the fact that, you know, there's a chemical in the brain called dopamine that surges when we do something that's like really overstimulating, like being on social media or, you know, my kids obviously aren't on social media, but like watching shows or playing video games or something like that, you know, there's a dopamine spike and then there's a plummet. 
and it feels uncomfortable in the body afterwards, right? So sometimes our kids are having, you know, difficulties transitioning away from those high intensity dopamine surging tasks. And if we're not aware of that as something that's going on in their brains, we might misconstrue that as bad behavior or like a random meltdown, but, you know, more often than not, and I venture to say like all the time, there's a biological reason why a kiddo is dysregulating, right? And so if we can just start to talk about that and normalize that with our kids, it leaves them with a self-concept that's rooted in reality and not in some negative shame story about themselves. Mm -hmm. So like my son is seven and He knows about dopamine. Like we talk about it all the time. He knows that if he's like whining and getting like, you know, I might just check in with him and be like, how's your blood sugar, bud? You know, like, do we need a snack right now? And, and are you hangry? (laughs) And like, that's a, that's a real thing for me, for him, you know, but the, the more that we can just kind of name it, then the less we're kind of engaging in these stories that we might tell ourselves about why somebody's behaving the way that they are or like what that means about them as a person. You know, it doesn't yeah. mean anything. It means that your nervous system is dysregulated. Okay. So what can we do to tend to our nervous system? And that goes for the parent too. You know, right. I, I talk about my own nervous system. Like I yelled at him pretty intensely the other day um, because I was super triggered. He, he kind of like he honestly, he ran his bike into my, <laughs> into my little girl. And I was like, super pissed about it. And my like mama bear brain went off. Right. And so, you know, I immediately just like yelled at him and then kind of like was able to resettle my own nervous system, got grounded. And then later on, actually the following day, I looped back around with him and I was like, listen, you know, when I yelled at you yesterday, that wasn't really about you. That was about my nervous system going into like mama bear fight mode. I felt like Am- Amelia was in danger, you know, and 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 that's why my brain went, wah, right? Mm-hmm. And so we're just kind of naming these together and normalizing it in our household mm-hmm. so that, you know, he doesn't have the story that I yelled at him because he's a bad kid, right? Now he knows that I yelled at him because my amygdala went off. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I think the more that we can talk about these things, the the healthier it is for kids to understand how their bodies work. And yeah. Yeah. When you have had that conversation with him, as an example, mm-hmm. how did he respond? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's heard this a thousand times from me. So he's like, I know, mom. <laughs> I know. You're in fight or flight. I get it. I get it. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I'm over it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so yeah, that kind of ties into my other question about this, which is, you know, the idea of like breaking, um, breaking kind of patterns or generational trauma mm-hmm. and, um, like what's the most important work for us to do as parents to ensure that we don't, repeat, um, patterns or kind of like project our own shortcomings. Yeah. I mean, that's a powerful question, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's the inner work. So like doing that inner work, you know, authentic emotional regulation, which guides us to tending to ourselves, tending to our own nervous system before we tend to our child's nervous system and their emotional needs. Like that's a paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. that's shifting away from generations and generations of women who have been taught to martyr themselves and, you know, um, moving away from our conditioned responses, whatever they may be, whether our conditioned responses to project rage out or whether our conditioned responses to repress, you know, the, the, the inner work of, parenting with intention, literally Mm -hmm. parenting with intention is to make that shift from your conditioned generational patterns, becoming aware of them, excavating the things that need to be seen and felt and held and healed in order to be able to make an intentional choice about how you want to show up for yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, Such profound 
deeply uncomfortable work, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, but it's so, it's so worth it. It's so worth it. I think. Uh, yeah, I would say it totally is. And I see on both sides of the spectrum, why there's the main word that stands out to me within it all is just, you know, awareness and some deeper levels of self-awareness and just kind of a spectrum of like becoming aware in the first place and then actually deciding to do the work once you are aware because there's that transition from like awareness to action too that can be take some time (laughs) and then the action I guess could be categorized as the inner work and I feel like we say inner work a lot Mm. but what would you if someone's like what the hell what is inner work what is it what the hell is it (laughs) how would you what would be your (laughs) your parenting with intention explanation of the end. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of different modalities, right? There's many ways up the mountain, um, many ways in. So inner work could include inner parts work where you become aware of the inner aspects of yourself that are coming up to be seen and healed. So like Mm -hmm. your inner young vulnerable self, your inner Mm -hmm. child, or maybe your inner protectors, you know, your inner teenager who's fucking pissed, your inner 22 year old, right? Like, so just becoming aware of these inner parts and bringing um, your presence of self, your adult self to those inner parts and listening to what they have to say, listening to what they want to share. You know, I'm sure you've heard the the saying, like, the body keeps the score, right? Like that book. Yeah, that, yeah. The, yeah. I read that book. Yeah, it's a trove, right? So, yeah. um, you know, inner work can also be somatic, like actually going into the, the body-based stuck energy that's in our bodies and shifting that energy around. And, you know, so... Really, I mean, you kind of have to do that with a guide, you know, somebody Mm -hmm. who knows how to guide you through somatic healing or inner parts work Um, because it is, it's it's gnarly Um, because the, the, the emotional energy that wants to move freely through the system, some of it's been stuck for years. Some of it's been stuck for generations, like Mm -hmm. past lives, you know, some of that stuff isn't even yours. Past um, lives, yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love talking about past lives. Yeah. Um, I love that you brought up somatic work in conjunction with it because I think a lot of times people think of the inner work as talk therapy or, you know, just literally just talking through things verbally when that is such a helpful part. And I know for me, a lot of um, the idea of like looking at the shadow side of ourselves as part of it is really helpful to see yeah. like where our triggers are and kind of where our patterns lie and it really goes hand in hand with that inner child because it's identifying a lot of things that are patterns that or triggers that stem from things yeah. that have happened when we were little and just kind of stuck with us or at different mm-hmm. points in our lives I like the inner teenager yeah. but then the body work too is so important not only like in inner work but also nervous system regulation, right? Like totally. Breath work. And yeah. and we have lots of Reiki practitioner friends. Mm-hmm. So that movement of energy for ourselves to unstuck energy. Yeah. And to just receive support too, right? Mm-hmm. To receive from others, um, I think can feel so good, especially as moms, right? We're so often pouring ourselves out and giving and planning and organizing and tending to everyone else that to just be in receiving mode feels so nice sometimes. Yeah. And in community too. I love that we, so for people listening, Carly and I live in the same area. A lot of my guests are virtual and I've never even met them before, but Carly and I actually live in the same area and we have a couple different, It's it seems like a lot of wellness center type places have been, um, there's a couple that have opened recently with the women in wellness group that we kind of both participate in. And it just seems as if a lot of people are just craving 
real in real life community, you know, not just internet community. And I think totally. that could be a byproduct of the pandemic, but where people just want to be in person yeah. and it's Isn't just it funny that in our geographical area, we do, right? We have so many magical women offering, you know, their energy healing, offering their, their soul. And it's like, you gotta Which wonder, is. right? You gotta wonder, it's like, are these just like all the women that were like burned at the stake here in the North Shore yeah. of Massachusetts in a past life coming back to like get weird and witchy in a safe Yeah, <laughs> We're like, yes, honey, we made it back. We got, yeah. we got back here. I know it's wild. I'm like, this is a, I feel so grateful as a mm. um, backstory. This is kind of cool too. I just rebalanced wellness, which is like kind of another little wellness place in town in Ipswich where I live. Um, when I realized it was there, I was just thinking like, I just need to go in there and say hi and be like, hi, I'm Katie. I'm like a health coach that lives a mile down the road and you're a wellness center in my town, you know, and mm -hmm. just put myself out there more because a intention of mine had been to make Make, create more sisterhood in my life and meet Love more like-minded women, especially after the pandemic and not dr deciding to stop drinking during the pandemic. And then being so fully invested online, I was like, I want to meet more people in the real world. Yeah. And I went in there and, um, I saw Liz and introduced myself and that was like how I got connected to everyone and I told I just sat down and talked to her for like a half hour that day yeah and as a side note Liz is the person that opened the village in our town and I'm saying this to listeners not you because you were at the opening <laughs> um, Liz is my like my best friend so. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I know who Liz is um but yeah it's just so funny how it unfolded and when I went in that day I was like yeah I just want to meet more like-minded women I have this vision of opening a collaborative wellness center and I had told her about sober curiosity and she was like, I stopped drinking during the pandemic too. And then when I went to the first women in wellness meetup, so many women there said that, and it's just very synchronistic and just all of the women are really cool, not yeah. pretentious wellness, like yeah. vibes at all. Like, the real shit. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Very down to earth, very supportive of each other. It's just so cool to see. Yeah. But definitely witches in the past life, all of us, probably. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So we talked about the inner work and what that means to you, especially with parenting. We talked about... Um, we talked about your course, which is, you said authentic emotional regulation is the name of it. I'm getting distracted right now because my battery's going to die. I need to oh, yeah. Me. Grab that cord. <laughs> And if you're listening, Carly is getting her cord. She's back. <laughs> I'm just hanging out. I have no clue how to edit, so uh, we'll just have a little lag here. <laughs> it's off. No, no, you're totally fine. This is all right. We're good. We're good. This is how it goes on the Mindful Constitution podcast. There we go. I always tell people at the beginning, I'm like, by the way, I don't know how to edit, so don't say anything you'll regret. <laughs> they're like no pressure um yeah so just talking about your business and i'll kind of get your closing words of wisdom more so there in terms of best advice for parents and whatnot but i did want to take some time to dive into your own story around sober curiosity and also how that plays into parenting too yeah. and your business and whatnot and so I know we have talked about how you kind of went down your own sober curious path and I wanted to hear more about that. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, it's kind of a wild story actually. Um, I'm trying to think back to like when this originally started. So like, you know, we're in the pandemic, I'm homeschooling my kids at that point. I have a super dysregulated kiddo at home. Things were just like really intense and I'm doing my own inner work at the time, right? With a guide, I'm doing my EMDR, I'm, you know, doing all mm -hmm. of the things. 
And so under this like pressure container and then going inward, I'm having this like intense spiritual awakening, right? Like this, it's just wild. Just like this awareness of the connectedness of it all. This awareness that, um, that there's a profound amount of love and connection available to us at all times, mm -hmm. which I wasn't feeling super connected to prior to that. You know, I felt very like burned by my Catholic upbringing and I was over that and like not, you know, just, yeah. So this is just like a wild time in life where things are happening, things are unfolding, all of the layers are peeling back. And I had basically a near death experience. <laughs> And woke up from that, I passed out in a hot tub, which is crazy. And I was totally sober at the time. I wasn't drinking or anything. Um, but when I sort of came to, there was like this download of knowing. I, I don't have any other way to describe it other than like, I just had this awareness that if I wanted to continue to open up and to continue to expand, the message was so clear that for me, alcohol just like wasn't conducive to that. It was like, just to be really clear, like it wasn't a, it wasn't a judgment. It wasn't like a moralistic, like if you want to be spiritual, then alcohol is bad. It wasn't like that at all. It was just like a deep inner knowing after I came to out of like drowning <laughs> that mm -hmm. If, if I'm going to continue on this road to like more expansion and pulling back the layers, the alcohol would just interfere with that. And so mm -hmm. it was just like a switch flipped. And I was like, oh, okay. And so basically I stopped drinking. <laughs> yeah. It's so wild how that happens. And it's just, it's so crazy. It feels like it happened for a lot of people and it's just so interesting. It's like people got like switched on kind of mm -hmm. during the pandemic. Like, all right, this is because I felt the same feeling where it's just, yeah, your life isn't going to be what you like really want it to be um, spiritually, professionally. Mm -hmm. um, I did not have a near death experience like you. <laughs> it was more just this like subtle inner knowing undertone. Yeah, mine was uh, the opposite of subtle. It was like boom. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, boom. You're uh you this is yeah, a download is like the perfect way to yeah. describe it, I feel like. Just yeah. all of a sudden a an kind of deep understanding. Yeah. But yeah, it's wild how that that you explained it that way. Cause that's kind of how I explain it too is and the same thing I think is so important to highlight is the non-judgmental aspect. And I think it's just almost so, it is challenging for it to not even come off that way when you even, ex it, not you specifically, but just when, mm -hmm. when I try to explain it to like, I just felt like it wasn't helping me become my highest self or like my most aligned self. I think it's so easy for people to automatically think like, oh, well, what is that saying about me? Right. And so how do you navigate that with your... I mean, do you share often with people you don't drink? Do you just kind of quietly not drink? How do you approach your alcohol-free life with yeah, your relationships? Okay. That's a good question. I haven't really thought about that. I don't I don't think I'm like super sharing openly about it in a purposeful way. Like this is the first time I've this is the first time anybody's ever asked me openly about it really? publicly. So I guess this is the first time I'm really talking about that. So it's not something um that I intentionally talk openly about. Um, but also, you know, like my close friends are, are like Liz and Megan who are opening the village and it, it's just become none of my friends drink anymore. So it's not mm -hmm. really even a thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like it's just sort of that sort of like organically has happened. Um, and you know, the, to be fair, like, yeah, some of my friends drink every once in a while. And like, you know, if I go out to dinner every once in a while, maybe have to have a glass of wine. Like I, it's totally a non-judgmental thing and I'm fine to hang out with people if they're, if they're drinking, you know, it's just not, um, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't like announce that I'm not going to drink. I'm just going to do me. Right. Like I'll order, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll whatever. Yeah. 
I know. I, I think it's, it is really, uh, a lot of people have a fear around that, especially people I work with. We're like, Oh, what are people going to think? And often it's because their friend group is a reflection of who they were. And I know that was the case for me because I used to drink a lot. And so when, and a lot of people I work with drink a lot. And so they're kind of surrounded by people who drink a lot. And so they're much more concerned right. about what yeah. people are going to think about it. And so it's been really interesting, this trajectory I've been on with um, just like drawing in so many more women who just kind of voluntarily don't drink. And so then when I go out into the real world and I have experiences, the other day I went um, to a yoga class and I was drinking a culture pop and this woman was like, oh, are you cracking a beer? And I'm like, no. And she's like, oh, not yet. And I'm like, no, not ever. I haven't in three years or something like offhandedly. She's like, oh, is that supposed to be a good thing? And I'm like, yeah, mm. for me, but to each their own. And I just think it's kind of funny sometimes. And I was watching a stupid reality show recently where they said something about someone not drinking being boring. And I'm like, oh, people still say stuff like that mm -hmm. or you know, like think that everyone drinks because it's just not my reality anymore and the yeah. people that I'm around and same for you because yeah. Yeah. So it was just, it kind of feels like it was an abrupt, an abrupt experience where you just knew this isn't for me anymore. And then what kind of impact has that had on your parenting and your business and sort oh, of yeah. anything you've noticed since deciding not to drink? I mean, parenting my kids, at least, like, while hungover is, like, not an option, you know? Like, it's, my kids are high intensity. Like, they take everything from me, you know? So, like, I just can't imagine having a slog through that feeling like shit. I mean, like, when you're trying to show up intentionally, like you just, you can't do that if you're exhausted and um, depleted from, and alcohol is a depressant, right? It's like, it, mm -hmm. it's depressing. So um, yeah, I, my parenting would not be as intentional as it is, I guess, if I was, if I was drinking a lot. Um, and like I said, like I have some pretty high needs, high intensity kiddos, so um, mm -hmm. they keep me on my toes. Yeah. And um, I mean, again, like I get moving back around to the judgment thing. Like, you know, if, if there are parents out there who are drinking and are showing up intentionally, that's cool too. You know, like I, it's, um, just for me, it would, it felt like it would not certainly not be conducive to me being able to show up and do the healing work that I'm doing. And like, you know, what I'm, what I'm trying to do internally is like, feel my feelings on mm -hmm. purpose. Right. And so you can't really do that if you're, um, if you're offline and yeah. And numbing because it is yeah. numbing to a certain right. extent. I mean, it's, it, um, even just a little bit can be, feel numbing and, right. And it's different for everyone. I'm big into like bio individuality and kind of finding your own way. And I love that. Mm -hmm more and more people are just deciding alcohol is not right for them. And it's not necessarily, a, it's not at all like a judgment on anyone else. It's more so like creating space for more people to feel okay about not drinking rather than judging people who drink. And so just giving that space, like if it doesn't serve you, you don't have to feel like you need to do it because everyone else is because there is downsides to it, especially parenting. And I think a lot of people, almost feel the opposite where they kind of like drink because mommy wine culture or just because everyone else is, or they're just not as aware of maybe the impact that it can have on us biologically or mentally or whatnot. And I think it's also because it's so hard, right? Like I get it at five o'clock, like you just, you want something to make it feel better. Right. And I get that. I really like, I really get that. And so, you know, authentic emotional regulation sort of t like has you diving right into the sensation in your body yeah. rather than trying to make that sensation go away. So mm -hmm. it's a practice. It's like learning how to surf the waves of intense sensation in the body. 
Um, but yeah. I understand not wanting to feel it because it's scary as shit to feel it. Right. So totally. And much, it can be really enticing to want to invo- uh, avoid, but I have a question for you. If somebody is in the habit of kind of self-medicating from parenting because it is exhausting and lots of people mm-hmm. do it and, it's, and it's also very normalized and kind of, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um, in the media, it's in memes, it's all over the place, right? As totally. wine, ma- like wine is the cure yeah. for motherhood or whatever. Yeah, of course. So what, how would you explain the benefit of, you know, actually not doing that? And when someone's like, yeah, fucking right. I don't want to feel my feelings and <laughs> sit through them at the end of a long day of mothering and I'm stressed out. And this is the coping mechanism that I have to just check out. Yeah. How would you explain what benefit they could find from, from actually doing the hard shit? Yeah. I mean, to be perfectly honest, I, I probably wouldn't, you know, like I'm not in the business of like convincing anybody mm-hmm. to show up to do the work, right? Like you'll yeah. show up when you're ready. You'll show up when the universe like presents you with an opportunity to show up and whether that be now or whether that be rock bottom that, or anywhere in between, that's up to you. Right. So like, mm-hmm. I would never, I would never take it upon myself to convince anybody that like now is the right time for them to, to, to do the inner work. Yeah. Um, so people really need to kind of come to that when they're ready and when they're, when they're open to doing it. Um, but for people who are open to doing it, I would say that the benefit is that you get to be who you want to be. You get to make the choices rather than parenting from just what your conditioning was, you know, either in your childhood or what society has conditioned you to think like you get to be empowered to decide you know, how do you want to handle this situation with your child? Even in coaching sessions, I'm never like handing a parent a perfect script to use, or even like, uh, here's what I think you should do. That's not what coaching is at all. Mm -hmm. Coaching is coming together to carve out time and space for parents to decide based on their own family values, based on their own desires and their own hopes and fears, like how they want to be in connection with themselves, how they want to be in dynamic with their child. And that really looks different for, for everybody. Um, I think so many people have actually, um, don't even haven't had the experience of that type of partnership before, especially just the way that our healthcare system set up and stuff where it's more so a kind of authoritarian relationship right. where I tell you what mm-hmm. to do, I fix mm-hmm. you. A lot of people are accustomed to that. And so at first it can be really daunting to tell people like, I'm not going to be, you know, fixing you or providing you answers. Like we're going to work together to find your answers. And so I love that you're drawing awareness to that aspect of coaching because it's, such an empowering process that even though it's so much harder, like working through it, it's very similar to the inner work of, and that would be where for people who want to do the work asterisk, um, what I would say as well is like, it's so uncomfortable going through it. And it's going to be like tremendously more uncomfortable than checking out with alcohol or whatever your distraction of choices, but like on the other side of it, it's like the ultimate fulfillment. Yeah. And so it's same thing with coaching, right? It's like, it's really hard to have to kind of be the in charge, like when mm-hmm. you're the client and realize like, okay, no one's going to do the work for me. And so I guess when you finally make that realization and for me too, I know there were so many years where it was a long time that I knew I needed to stop drinking or that it was going to be like the path to Mm -hmm. my ultimate fulfillment or like reaching my personal potential. But I didn't do it because I was too scared of how it would impact my life, what I would actually have to face. And I just wasn't ready to do it, even though deep down inside, I knew at some point the mm-hmm. reckoning was coming. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's like this weird process of it rising to our awareness. And then finally, it's kind of hard to ignore. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I love that you're mentioning that with coaching too, because I think it's so important. And um, 
Yeah. It's like a, a coach. I feel is a guide help to support you through the inner work in a way. Totally. There's also this beautiful, like, um, opportunity to pass down to our kids something different. Like, so again, my son, Jack is very verbal and, you know, we talk about all the things, right. He, um, you know, so we've talked about the fact that like our ancestors have a hard time with alcohol, right? Like we have, we've got lots of ancestors on both sides of the family that like can't stop drinking alcohol once they start. And so Jack at seven years old is aware of that, you know, and we've had conversations about how like, you know, it's with our, with our ancestry, it's, it's hard to just have one glass of wine or one beer, you know, and if you drink too much, it makes you sick. So Mm -hmm. he's very aware of that. And, and it feels good for us to just kind of like be bringing the generational um, challenges to light and looking at that again, without judgment, without shame, and just saying like, this is what, this is what we've got going on in our bloodline, you know? So right. and for yeah. him to know that at a young age, you know, and for that to just be like kind of common chit chat amongst us. I know it's funny that you actually said that because I was going to ask, you know, and this is something John and I have conversations about just as someone who doesn't drink and he drinks very mindfully at this mm-hmm. point. I mean, we were both not mindful in the past, but, um, we've talked about, you know, how do we want to present alcohol and stuff? Like what kind of parents do we want to be when it comes to substances, weed, alcohol, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, especially being that I don't drink. I've thought a lot about how I want, I don't want to villainize alcohol to my children Mm -hmm. because i through the lens of coaching, like want to provide them autonomy in their decisions Mm -hmm. and allow them to have their own experience and make their own decisions and give them, you know, this was my, and similar to what you said with, um, in terms of modeling and emotional regulation is, and explaining your emotions, like explaining my own choices and why Mm -hmm. I made the ones I did with alcohol and, yeah. And whatnot, but like you're your own person. And so, And just giving facts about the biology, right? Like kind of coming back to what we were talking about before about talking to your kids about their nervous system, about their dopamine, about their blood sugar. It's like, these are the facts, right? Like in our, in our generational biology, this is a thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's not, you can do with that information what you will. Right. And like you said, I think it's really powerful to not villainize any of it. Mm -hmm. Um, Just to just know what you're dealing with in your body and yeah. to bring awareness to that is super empowering. Yeah. And because we, it really is how we use it. And it's just that I think how, the way that we do use it and the way that alcohol is normalized now maybe isn't the most conducive to our healthiest selves, but that doesn't mean like there's not plenty of people that have a working relationship with alcohol that fits their life and fits their needs and fits, um, you know, what, whatever role they want it to have. Um, and so you kind of said you touch upon generational past generations issues with alcohol, but is, how would you address, um, like, do they notice you don't drink and is, and it's something you kind of have said, like, I just, I had a spiritual awakening or how do you talk to them about it? (laughs) Um, It's something, yeah, it's definitely something that my kids are aware of because like you said, like in your partnership, um, you know, my husband will mindfully drink, you know, he's into like craft beer. And so he gets very geeky about that, you know, and like, so my kids are aware that like daddy drinks beer, um, but he does. Yeah. Like, he drinks, but he's not drinking to excess. And so with that contrast, they're aware that mom doesn't drink. Um, Mm -hmm. So they're just kind of seeing both of those things. Um, But yeah, it's something that's awesome. Pretty openly in our family about lots of things, most everything. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I think anything that, especially with kids, I just imagine anything that you kind of villainize or put, into this category of extreme is only Mm going to make 
them more curious mm-hmm. in a way, mm-hmm. you know, so, yeah. and empowering them as individuals. That's my goal at least. Yeah. But from the parenting with intention expert, <laughs> that's an approved approach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. yeah. So I wanted to kind of just loop everything together by asking, you know, especially with the stressors that particularly mothers face Mm. societally and expectations wise, like how would you, what would be kind of your first steps to our first pieces of advice for someone getting started on trying to parent with more intention, trying to be more present with their kids and emotional regulation. Where do people start with this type of stuff? Cause I know it just goes really deep. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It's a great question. You know, so in the authentic emotional regulation course, it teaches parents a consistent framework for how to handle any challenging moment with their child. And the framework is that the parent tends to their own needs first And then once the parent feels grounded and anchored and connected with themselves, then we tend to the child's emotional needs and logistical needs. And then once the child is feeling grounded and connected, after that, we can address any lesson that needs to be learned, right? So Mm -hmm. with that flow in mind, which is kind of um, the opposite of what society tells us to do, right? Like these like kind of underlying messages that like as mothers, especially that we should just be like doing it all and showing up for everybody all the time and meeting everybody else's needs. And, you know, um, so how you would start on that journey is by tending to your own needs first, right? Like when we think back to like psych 101 and we think back to that like Maslow's hierarchy, that triangle, like the baseline foundation Mm -hmm. is like, are your basic needs met, right? So like- Did you eat? (laughs) Right, did you eat? Did you drink? Do you feel safe, right? Are you sleeping, right? So those needs actually do need to be met first before we're going to get to any of that, like higher level self-actualization stuff. Yeah. So I think the advice that I would give, especially to new mothers, right. With babes and arms is like basics. Make sure you go to the bathroom when you have to pee, like, don't wait, don't put it off. Right. Like feed yourself in the morning. (laughs) Yeah, dude. I know it's, it is hard. And I see, and I like fully get the, um, tending to yourself first Mm -hmm. and especially working in the field we work in is, you know, we get that, but it is, it's like really put to the test. Even for me, when I'm a new mom, I literally feel sometimes like, sorry, I, even today I'm like, I feel like I can't talk right. Like my brain feels like mush sometimes. Um, but it is, it's like so tempting, you know, when he goes to sleep to be like, okay, I can just cram in some work or like do this. Yeah. I'm like, no, yeah, you're going to be more tired. Like you have to. And I think people laugh. First. Yeah. People laugh off like the idea of self-care and I know it's thrown around very nonchalantly these mm-hmm. days and like self-care, self-care, but it is so true. That's like, if your needs aren't met and thankfully that's something that John understands and he's like, go do a hot yoga class. Like mm-hmm. I'll walk, go do something for yourself. Like at least like a couple times a week. Mm-hmm. And it really does help. It makes such a difference when I can go to a yoga class or just take an hour to myself to do something, whatever it is or whatever it is for you that like refills your cup to be able mm-hmm. to then show up joyfully yes. to be with my baby all day and be mm-hmm. present with him and be happy about it. And not like, you know, who wants to slowly be like building up resentment towards their kids because they're never able to take any time to themselves. Like you're ultimately sacrificing the quality of your parenting, which is doing the opposite of what you're hoping to do by like spreading yourself so thin. Right. Right. You don't have to be a hero about it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, so- and then reaching out for help when you need help, right? Like mm-hmm. if you, if you are struggling to 
create time and space for yourself organically, you know, to meet your needs, then reach out for help and get, you know, coaching support or therapy or whatever it may be, you know, because sometimes it really does take like dedicating some time and space in the week to like making a plan with somebody and talking about what's coming up and also exploring the like, why, why are, what's coming up? Like what parts are coming up that are telling us like, we can't prioritize our needs. Mm -hmm. Um, Usually there's a lot, there's a lot around that. You know, if somebody's Mm -hmm. really struggling to just even meet their most basic fundamental needs, there's usually some stuff around that that needs to be seen and dealt with. Yeah. Um, So yeah. That's where yeah, no, it's real though. The struggle is real. Some days mm-hmm. I'm like, I need to shower. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it needs to happen yeah. soon. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is. It's so true. And I think that's advice that people can't hear enough of. Yeah. And so, okay, before we end, I want to, you just tell people where they can find you. Just reiterate everything you have going on right now. And like, where is the best places for people to find you? Sure. Yeah. So I'm on Instagram um, at parenting with intention and it's parenting underscore with underscore intention. Mm -hmm. Um, So you can find me posting about parenting stuff there quite frequently. Um, Or you can go to my website, which is learningwithintention.com. And um, you can DM me or email me if you have any questions. Mm -hmm. I'm here and available if you want to think through anything together or yeah and your course is that something people can just buy you know independently and then if they also want to work with you they can do that too yeah so the authentic emotional regulation course is recorded in three modules if you know like for some parents just sort of like listening to like a 20 minute segment while they're driving in the car is like more accessible than you know, any other modalities. So the course is available. Um, you can purchase and download it and that can kind of like walk you through, like I said, the consistent framework that you can use in order to help yourself stay connected. You know, when your child's having big, intense meltdowns, when you're having big, intense meltdowns, um, you know, and how to show up for yourself and, um, how to understand like the, the brain science behind what's going on with that. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, the Authentic Emotional Regulation course is available. You can find that either on my Instagram link in the bio or on my website, learningwithintention.com. And then I have one-to-one coaching slots available. Summer's kind of full, but um, I think I have a couple slots left and then fall is going to be rolling out soon, which is wild to think about. Um, Yeah. And then there's some other resources that I have available um, either, you know, through finding me on Instagram or the website you know, for families to just take a little bit of a dip their toe into all that parenting with intention stuff and executive Mm -hmm. functioning and brain science. So, yeah. Yeah, I know. We didn't even get into that. Damn it. Yeah, it's all right. (laughs) Podcast number two. Yes. But, well, thank you so much. Awesome. I feel like this was really nice for me too. Mm -hmm. Good reminder for me too, as a new mom. Um, so thanks for coming on yeah, thank and you for having me katie yeah thanks everyone for listening and we'll see you next time bye